There is none beside thee. You are the great I am. That's the God that we come here to worship today. And, and what a great God it is that we worship. The demons run and flee. That's the kind of God that I want to pursue. That's the kind of God that I want to know. That's the kind of God that we come to worship today. As you read through the Bible, as you see the different people and their reactions to Jesus Christ while he was on earth, you see that there are people who had that passion, that desire to know Jesus. We're going to look at one of those guys this morning. His name is Zacchaeus. If you have a Bible, we ask that you would turn to uh, Luke chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one of the chairs in front of you. It's page 743. Uh, if you have a tablet, a phone, you can find Luke 19. If you have your own Bible, uh, Luke is kind of toward the end of the Bible. It's in the New Testament, uh, after the books of Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. Toward the end of his ministry, Jesus was uh, traveling and preaching and teaching to crowds of people. And uh, he comes to the city of Jericho. And I'll start reading there in Luke 19, starting with verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Zacchaeus was a wealthy tax collector. He was the chief of the tax collectors, and that means that he worked for the Roman government. And the Romans were occupiers of the nation of Israel. And so he was collecting taxes for a foreign power, and then he was taking more than he should. And that's how he got to be wealthy. And this tax collector heard that Jesus was coming to town, and he knew that he wanted to pursue Jesus. He wanted to pursue Jesus. And he sets an example for us today. When you look at Zacchaeus, uh, the, the Bible says he ran ahead and climbed a tree. There's all kinds of issues right here. Number one, um, Zacchaeus needed to climb a tree because he was affected with something a lot of you have, and that's just that he was way too short. It's obviously not an issue I have, but it's one that you'll have to get over. Um, but beyond that, he was wealthy, and so he probably had his nice clothes on climbing up into this tree. And remember, he was also very unpopular. The people around despised him because he was taking more, he was working for a foreign government, and he was getting wealthy off of taking too much from the people there. And so he had some obstacles to overcome when he wanted to pursue Jesus. But he had heard so much, and he had maybe seen people that had met Jesus, and he wanted to be near Jesus. What are your obstacles? What's keeping you from Jesus? You know, some of you may have grown up uh, with parents that didn't treat you right. Maybe they never complimented you. Maybe they never told you you were worth anything. Maybe they, they called you all kinds of names. Maybe they were physically violent to you. And because of that, it's hard for you to picture a God in heaven who loves you. Uh, some of you may have lost a loved one, someone that you're really close with for a really long time, and they passed away, and you're angry with God because he took them from you too early. Uh, some of you may have a physical affliction where there's, you have some health type of an issue where it's just you're constantly in pain and you wonder, God, why, why don't you take this away from me? Well, the obstacles that happen in our life can push us away from God. And to be honest, I see this happen time and time again in people's lives. Something happens in their life and they're like, you know what, if this is the way God's going to treat me, then just forget him. I don't want to be a part of him. And so they go and they try and solve the problems on their own, and they, they try and medicate that pain. And they medicate using drinking or drugs or sex or entertainment, or they throw themselves into the work, whatever they can do to distract themselves from the pain. But you can also let your pain and your weaknesses, your insufficiencies, you can use those things to draw you closer to God to understand that you can't do these things on your own. Instead of hiding and masking and running from the pain, you can take it to God who says, you know what, I'm, I'm here for you. 
you can seek after God with all of your heart and see that he is the one who satisfies you. The song that we sang just a, a few minutes ago is, it comes from Psalm 42. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? You know, the writer of the Psalms was dealing with whatever he was dealing with. He says, God, my soul longs for you. I thirst after you. God, with all the things that are going on in this world, in my life, and my situations, I know I need someone bigger than me. God, I am desperate for you. I'm desperate for your presence. When you pursue Jesus like that, the Bible says you're going to find him. The Bible says he's going to fill you up. He's going to satisfy you. And it doesn't matter what obstacles are there. You can pursue Jesus like that, and he takes care of those, those issues that you have. There's a guy, uh, his name is Nick. His last name starts with a V. Not even going to try and pronounce it, all right? I have no idea. But Nick is, is a, kind of a world-famous motivational speaker. He's, he's presented to millions of people. He's written a couple of books. He's got a couple of DVDs that are motivational. Um, Nick has uh, just done some amazing things throughout the world, encouraging people and telling them to overcome obstacles. And Nick has a, a, a lot of good reasons to let you believe him. Because, see, Nick was born without any legs or arms. And one of his messages is, hey, no, no legs, no arms, no worries. And uh, he talks to people about overcoming obstacles, and he talks about what God can do in your life because he says what God has done in his life. He shares about the, the things that he has overcome. He talks about, you know, being married and, and having a kid, and, and it's just a very interesting thing. See, we all have obstacles. We all have things in our life that, that could push us away from God, but those same obstacles can bring us closer to God if we turn them over to him. You know, Zacchaeus, you know, could have said, well, I'm just too short. I just can't see through the crowd. I'll just I'll go some other day. He didn't let any obstacles come in his way. He said, you know what? I'm climbing the tree. These people already hate me, so it doesn't matter what they think if I'm already up there. Who cares, you know? And so he said, I'm going to pursue Jesus. I'm going to see this guy I've been hearing all this stuff about. We can do the same thing today. The second thing we learned from Zacchaeus is that we need to obey Jesus. We need to obey him. Jesus is walking along the streets, crowds of people all around him. And I don't know how Jesus always does this, but in, in the midst of these crowds of people, he sees this guy up in a tree. He gets there to the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to your house. And now Zacchaeus, if you think about it, Zacchaeus could have had a lot of different reactions to that. Zacchaeus' reaction could have been, mm, well, hold on now, Jesus. I just came to see you from a distance. Honestly, uh, going to lunch with you today, I don't know that we can do that. I had some plans for this afternoon, some friends I had to see, and you want to come to my house? Yeah, well, it needs some tidying up before you show up, okay? My family's just not going to like you just showing up. Uh, Jesus, I like seeing you from a distance, but being this close and personal, that's a little bit more than I asked for. And I think we do that. I think we do that. I think that there are times that we read the Bible or we hear a message in a sermon or, or we sing some words to a song and, and God puts a conviction on us in some fashion and we stop, stop and say, oh God, hold on, hold on. Get a little too close. Now, what was I going to do this afternoon? I was going to go watch the game. You know, the Pro Bowl's on this afternoon, so I, I'm going to watch that. And we take those things where God's trying to talk to us and tell us to do something and we focus on something else instead of being obedient. See, when Jesus said, come down immediately, Zacchaeus came down at once. He came down at once and welcomed him gladly. He was thrilled that Jesus wanted to be a part of his life. You know, there are some people that think, man, I've just done so many things, so many bad things throughout my life. There's no way that God could love someone like me. Zacchaeus is like, you want to spend time with me? Do you see what everybody else thinks about me and you want to go to my house for lunch? He welcomed him gladly. What if Jesus came to you today and said, hey, I'm coming to your house for lunch? Uh, what would your reaction be? Well, you know, I've already got lunch plans, Jesus. It's, it, it's all right. Uh, may, maybe next week. You want to come to my house? Well, let me go and straighten some stuff up, <laughs> move some stuff out of the visual sight so we can't see those things. 
what do you do when God tries to get your attention in a service? Do you, do you obey immediately? Do you do the things to follow God? Or do you kind of put him off and think that your way would be better? In the Old Testament, there's a story of King Saul. And King Saul was getting ready to fight a big battle against the enemy. But something needed to happen before. The, the, the prophet Samuel needed to offer a sacrifice before the battle. Well, the issue was Saul's men started to see who they were fighting against. And they're like, yeah, I don't think I want to be a part of that. And so they started deserting. And he kept losing more and more men. And Saul started looking around and going, yeah, I need to get the sacrifice done now because uh, we need to go fight them soon before all my men leave. And so Saul took it upon himself as the king to offer the sacrifice. That wasn't his place. He was stepping into places he shouldn't be. And that was the prophet's job and not, not, Sam, uh, not Saul's. As soon as he got done offering the sacrifice, Samuel the prophet showed up and said, hey, what'd you do? So I was like, oh, I didn't do nothing, man. There's, there's nothing. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I didn't offer that sacrifice. And Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. You know, Saul's response was, well, I was doing a good thing. You know, I was making sure I put God first. Yeah, but you weren't being obedient to God. You weren't doing the things he told you to do. You were supposed to wait, and Samuel would, offer the, or Samuel would offer the sacrifice. But you took it upon yourself to, to hurry things along. And we see that Saul had the kingdom taken away from him. Because to obey, to follow what God wants, is better than doing good things on our own. I don't know how much you guys watch TV or sports or anything like that, but, but when you don't follow the rules, stuff happens. Now, I'm sure we've got a room full of Patriots fans here today, and, and you know, when something as silly as this makes headlines across the country, you know, it, if you don't know what's going on, the New England Patriots in this last football game they played, um, a, a bunch of the footballs they were using were deflated beyond what they were supposed to be, okay? So it's supposed to be easier to grip and stuff like that. Well, the head coach has gone on TV and said, I have no idea what happened. Um, the quarterback has gone on TV and said, I have no idea what happened. Now, I don't know what happened, okay? But somewhere along the line, someone broke some rules in that organization. And when they broke the rules, the entire country knows about it. It's on newspaper headlines. It's on TV headlines. It's everywhere. And I just think it's hilarious that they're making this big a deal about something like that. But they broke the rules. Now, thankfully for most of us, if we break some rules today, it's probably not making national headlines. Kind of happy about that. But... What's happened to that coach and to that quarterback is people question their integrity. People are calling them liars. There's no way that they couldn't possibly know. You know, when we break God's rules, when we're not obeying God, then bad stuff happens. Well, then how do I know? How do I know if, if God is telling me to do something? I mean, it would be cool if Jesus just walked in here today. If he just walked in here today and said, okay, I'm coming to your house for lunch, I would get up, I would go to lunch. But he doesn't do that, does he? And so how do I know? Well, when you read the Bible and you have things that just stick out to you and you go, wow, that, that just makes a lot of sense. That, that's something I need to do. That's God speaking to you through his word. When you, when you listen to sermons, either here live or, my goodness, there are so many sermon resources online these days. There are so many great preachers out there that you listen to that, you get convicted and say, wow, that's something I need to do better. You know, stop denying it, stop hiding it, stop trying to get around it. You know, when you listen to Christian music and, and a message in there at some place convicts you of something, then you go, okay, well, that's what it is. And then you pray and say, God, God, I feel like you're trying to teach me something. I feel like you're trying to lead me something. You want me to obey in this way. Is that right? And when you know, when you do that, God is going to say, he's going to make it inside of you. You're going to go, yeah, this is what I need to do. And the question happens then, when you understand what God's telling you to do, what are you going to do with it? For Zacchaeus, he climbed up the tree. He just kind of wanted to see Jesus. Hey, who is this guy everyone's talking about? But when Jesus says, get down here, I'm going to your house, Zacchaeus said, all right, let's go. Immediately followed. We need to pursue Jesus. We need to obey Jesus. And then we need to repent before Jesus. You know, 
I think that this story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19, I think it's kind of a synopsis. I don't think it tells us everything that went on there. I think there's some more conversations that happened with him and Jesus. But here's what happened. When Jesus called him down and Zacchaeus said, okay, let's go, the people around started to look down on the situation. They're like, you know, if Jesus really understood who he was going to lunch with, it would be totally, totally different circumstances. But Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus said, you know what? At some point he was convicted and said, I, I need to do the right thing here. And so he said, here and now I give half of my possessions. And if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay back four times what I took. How many of us have been convicted deeply enough that we said, you know what? You're right. I, I need to make up for this. I was wrong. I did something wrong, and, and I need to change. And let me show you how desperate I am to change. I'm going to sell half of my possessions and give it to the poor. And if I've cheated any of you, I'll, I'll pay you back four times. I mean, think through that. That's, that's some pretty serious stuff. Zacchaeus was convicted and said, you know, I really want to do this. He was repentant. And repentance in the Bible means remorse plus restitution when necessary. Remorse, that there is a change in my heart. Sometimes we change, but it's not because it was a change in our heart. Maybe you saw a video this week of a pizza delivery guy that went to the car dealership. And he, he took them the pizzas and stuff like that. And it was like $42. And, and they gave him like $49. So he thought it was a tip. So he took off, you know, feeling pretty good about himself. Well, they called and said, get back here and give us the $7 back. And so when he drove back to the car dealership, uh, they, they've got a video of the people in the, <laughs> there just beating, just verbally beating him up, telling him he's stupid, he's an idiot, just going off on him, showing you how stupid he was to take the extra $7. And then they put the video online thinking that they're going to make him look like an idiot. And what happened was it backfired. And so everyone else saw the way they were treating this pizza guy. And so they started a fundraising campaign, and most of the people were given $7. They raised $15,000 for the pizza guy. And then... The owner of the car dealership got involved and said, well, I don't even know who this person was. They don't even work for us. But this person, they're fired. Now, the question is, I guess one that we can't really know, did the owner of the dealership, did he make those decisions because he felt bad or because he got caught? Yeah. We've probably all been there, haven't we? <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, uh, John the Baptist is preaching. And when he's preaching, he says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And what that means is, is that, first of all, repentance is the remorse. I feel bad for what I did. I realized that it was wrong. I realized that I made a mistake. I made a choice to do something wrong. I want to fix that. I am sorry for what I did. That's remorse. And then the restitution comes where I say, you know what, what can I do to make up for this? And if we are truly remorseful for what we did, the, the way that it shows up, the fruit that's produced from that, will match that. Repentance is the remorse, the feeling bad, plus the making up for it. And the making up for it may be a change in our behavior, a change in our attitude a change in, in who we are and how we interact with people. Now, when I say that, um, it is easier to be repentant for things that you do. Okay? Because you can see, I did this wrong, I shouldn't have done it, let me repent for that. It's easier to do that than it is for things that you don't do. Well, I, why would I need to repent for something I didn't do? Because the Bible says, if you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, it's a sin. And so there are things that God has put on your heart, on your mind, where God is saying, I want you to do this, and you didn't do it. Well, that's a sin. And we need to be repentant for the sins of the things that we should have done that we haven't done. And guys, I'm, I'm starting with us, okay? Guys, I'm starting with us. There are some men in our church 
who, who are doing a good job spiritually. They're, they're involved in, in reading God's word. They're meeting with other guys and, and holding each other accountable. And, and you can see the maturity as they're growing and changing their lives in accordance with, with what God's word says. There are some guys that are doing that, but there's a lot of us guys that are not. We're missing out. I can't tell you how many times women have come to me and said, Brian, I would give anything if my husband would just be the spiritual leader of our house. I mean, anything. And I, and I just, I don't know what to tell them. I, I can tell them what they can do to help the situation in their lives. And there's so many times, though, that it's like something has to break in your husband's mind. It's got to break in his heart. Something's got to get him to a place where he just gets desperate and says, God, I humble myself before you. And I'm sorry, and I'll do whatever it takes. Guys, I know that sometimes we don't know what it means to be a spiritual leader in our house, but next week, where you come to service, we're going to have a, a, a challenge for the people in our church and saying, if you want to grow spiritually, here's some things that you can do. And it's going to be a challenge that'll last from February all the way through December. And we're saying, if you want to grow closer to God, this is what you need to do. You know, it's, it's amazing what will happen if we can just get even just a few people fired up with their walk with God. It's amazing what can happen and what can change in a church, in a community, in a nation when people say, I'm going to take this seriously. And in our church, we've seen some people start down that path. We see some people do those things, but it's a fire that has to spread throughout the entire congregation. Samuel Adams is one of the, the, the founders of our country. He was part of the Revolutionary War. He says, it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. Samuel Adams said, you know what? I don't need everybody to, to do this. What I need is some people who will get on fire and get fired up and say, you know what? This is important, and this is what I'm going to do. And when even just a few people do it, they catch on fire, and that fire spreads to other people. That's the guys who started the Revolutionary War in this country. We look back on the way that when guys get fired up, when men of the church say, I'm not sitting around anymore, but I'm going to be involved, and I'm going to lead the way. When men do that in a church, it changes the church. It changes families. It changes countries. This week, what can you do? This week, what can you do in, in preparation for what we're going to tell you about next week? This week, you can repent. Say, God, man, I've blown it. And I have not been the leader that you've called me to be. And I have not been the spiritual man that you've called me to be. And so you spend this week talking to God and saying, God, I am sorry, and I want to be different. And then you pursue Jesus. If you don't know how to pursue Jesus uh, in your bulletins this morning, we have um, scriptures that you can read every day. That's the place you start this week. Pursue Jesus, talk to him, read what his word says. And then you obey Jesus. The things that you come across, the things that, you, that, that he tells you to do, do those things. Live them out. But people will think I'm weird, but I don't know how this could possibly affect my walk with God. It doesn't matter what you think. If God's word says it, then that's what you do. Church, I think we're on the verge of some really great things happening. I really believe that. I, I, I'm excited about what this year has in store for us. But I know it, it, it doesn't start with the church doing things. It starts with individuals saying, I'm going to be on fire for God. I'm going to embarrass myself by climbing some tree when I'm in my nice Sunday clothes. And I, if everyone out there sees me, I don't care. I don't care. Jesus, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus said, look at what Zacchaeus has done. Look at the change of heart that he's had. Salvation has come to this house because I came to seek and save what was lost. That's why Jesus came. And there are some of you uh, this morning that feel like you've just done way too many things that God can never accept you. Look at Zacchaeus. 
I mean, he was stealing from people in his own country. It doesn't matter what you've done. God says, I came to seek and to save you. And salvation can come to your house today. But you have to let him. At some point, you have to choose to sign up to be a part of God's family. If you have not done that, I'll be available after the service in the back. I'd love to have that conversation with you. But for the rest of us, we look at, that, we look at the uh, example that Zacchaeus set and say, you know what, I want to pursue Jesus. I pursue him most when I obey him and when I repent before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the example that Zacchaeus set. We pray that we can have the same attitude that he did. We say, you know what, God, I, I give it all up and, and I follow you. God, I pray that you'll work in our hearts and our minds this week. That as a church, we can be set on fire for you. You are the great I am. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're sitting on the left-hand side of one of the aisles, just ask that you would take those black books, fill it out, pass it down the row. Uh, as you Also, uh, we have prayer cards in, in the chairs in front of you. It's a chance for us to, to as a church, to pray for you. And so uh, write down your prayer requests, write down your praises. Uh, you can stick them in the offering bags when they come in just a minute, or you can put them in the black boxes uh, in the doors, uh, by the doors in the back. But right now, we're also going to take up an offering. It's interesting that Zacchaeus understood that uh, his wealth was probably going to keep him from his walk with God. And so he knew that that was an area that he really needed to trust God. I'm going to give my possessions. If I've cheated people, I'm, I'm going to give back to them financially. You know, we probably haven't done that. But we need to trust God with our finances. You know, to, to be obedient to him means doing the things he says. And I know it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to trust God in that. But he tells us to obey him. So if you're visiting with us today, you don't need to feel obligated to give here. There's a chance for our regular attenders and our members to give to support this church. But if you're visiting with us uh, to your church, that's where you can give. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the ways that you've blessed us, the ways you've given to us. Father, I pray that you give us the courage and the strength to trust you and to live out our faith by the way that we give. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.